The knowledge to nurture at skillforkids.com. Well, welcome guys. Uh, we've got a great video tutorial coming your way today. We're going to deal with perception action coupling. Now some of you may or may not know what perception action coupling is. Now it's a really key coaching concept. It's probably becoming more and more um, in mainstream kind of coaching methodology of late. But it's something that I think is one of the most important coaching concepts to actually adhere to for skill-based sports. So what exactly is it? So in coaching terms, it refers to skill learning experiences where the performance of a motor action is preceded by the visual perception event that would be there in competition. All right, so we perform a motor action, whether it's a, say a baseball shot, is what that athlete sees before they actually perform the motor action, what they see, is it the same as what they would see in the actual competition? So, in coaching then, we try and replicate the perceptual experience of the athlete as they're trying to improve at their motor actions. So let's have a, have a look at some scenarios before we delve deeper into that. A couple of examples. Let's start with baseball, for example. And we'll use um, a kid learning how to you know, improve their baseball stroke, technique, shot, against a ball machine compared to against an actual thrower. Now, against a ball machine, if you think about what that kid's actually seeing, it's not going to be what they would actually see in a competition, which is where they're seeing actually someone pitch it. All right, so what's better is that they actually see someone pitching at them because that's going to replicate that perceptual environment and we'll explain why it's important for that. The other one is cricket, which is a very example with ball machines or not ball machines, and they're actually starting to develop, they've actually, well, they have developed uh, ball machines now that actually have video images um, of someone bowling and it coming out of the actual slot where the, the hand is. So it replicates that perceptual environment more closely and it's better for skill learning experiences. The second one would say basketball. Let's imagine a kid's practicing shooting or, or, um, or passing, say passing, and they're practicing a pass. So they could run up, practice the move, and then actually the end pass to that move. So doing that in isolation, and they could practice that to get the, you know, the actual feel of doing it in isolation. But what's better is that they're actually practicing that move um, within more of an open play situation, which is not always easy to do, but more of an open play situation. So they're actually seeing you know, people moving, um, you know, uh, opponents, um, the person they've got to pass to, the actual perceptual environment, what's actually happening in a, in a, in a game sense, then to execute that skill. skill. All right, or tennis is another one. Good example, feeding a ball out of the hand compared to actually doing something's live ball where actually an opponent's actually hitting it. Now, we'll just break that down for a second and, and talk about two ways that you may um, you know, read the play or anticipate, say, in tennis. The first is actually just seeing the, seeing the ball all right, so, so just visually tracking the object. But the second is actually seeing, you know, the body position of the player, you know, the stance they're in, the shoulder rotation, the racket angle, all things that athletes take in, you know, very quickly and learn to take in implicitly. So it's better if they're learning against seeing that type of uh, event down the other end. And we'll explain why again. So we've got three examples there of different kind of training situations where one, the, I suppose that it adhered to perception action coupling or, or the, what we spoke about first was where it wasn't quite the same, where they didn't actually have the same perceptual experience of, um, you know, before they performed the motor action. Now, we'll just take a step there and we'll just really clarify the term perception or perceptual. So perception is really the understanding of sensory information. All right, so if visual perception is understanding the visual information that's coming into the brain from the eyes and making sense of that. So for sport, it's making sense of, you know, what's happening in the sporting field and what's happening in, you know, the visual field, but not just seeing it, but making sense of it. So usually say for baseball, for example, it might be someone, you know, about to pitch, all right, but they're going to, 
going to have a, they've got a different grip on the ball or they move the hand slightly different when they're actually releasing the pitch. Now players will instinctively pick up on those things and that allows them to adjust their stroke, but as well as actually tracking the ball. So there's two ways their, their um, players will be perceiving in these kind of complex skill sports like baseball, cricket, tennis, basketball. Okay, so that should set the scene for us. So what is perception action coupling? We've gone over a little bit what exactly is perception. And then some examples. So now we're going to deal with perception, action, coupling, and the brain. So we're going to go over exactly why perception, action, coupling, and ensuring it for kids' developmental experiences is such an important thing in terms of making their skill learning experiences as beneficial as possible. So every skill learning experience, they're, they're getting the maximal uh, learning effect that can take place in each of those experiences. And as coaches, I suppose that's one of our key roles is to try and maximize the learning that is taking place. Because kids can only you know, be playing baseball, football, soccer and stuff for certain periods of time. So we need to maximize those, those, those minutes that they are. So let's think about it. Let's use our, our baseball example again. The kids seeing, looking, all right? for the ball that's going to come their way. That information from the eyes getting fed into that part of the brain. Part of the brain that receives that visual information. Now, this is going to be the simplified version because when the brain is working, it's hugely complicated and there's different parts of the brain communicating all the time. The emotional parts of the brain, you know, communicating with the memory parts of the brain, communicating with the visual part of the brain, so it's not this simple, but this really helps us understand why perception action couplings, um, how it works and how it's beneficial. <laughs> so it brings it in here. Now this part of the brain will receive the, the visual information and work with other parts of the brain to effectively understand it. So it will communicate with the memory part of the brain in particular because um, it's, it's a, you, taking all the information that it's seen before in relation to someone pitching at them and then using that memory to assess effectively what they're seeing now compared to what they've seen in the past. And that helps obviously when you get really great athletes who can read the play and anticipate that that process is amazing and happens obviously extremely quickly and they've got this mass, massive database of information that the memory system's um, accessing and, and, and using. So into here, this part of the, this communicates with this, the motor part of the brain, the one that's gonna deliver the motor actions. Now we want this part of the brain connected with this part of the brain, have awesome connections, in huge amount of connections, and really kind of complex and multiple pathways for, for that information to be delivered. Motor part of the brain, it then sends out the signals to perform the action, which is the hitting, the hitting component. Now, you could, anyone can swing it, but can they swing it at, at exactly the right time the right speed, right, the right position of the bat in relation to that ball, and that's gonna be based on how well they've understood very quickly, obviously, in milliseconds, the information that's been coming towards them. All right, they send out and they perform the actions, all right, and that baseball has been swung. Baseball has been swung, make connection, away we go. Now, effectively, if we don't have perception action coupling, we're not working this part the way we want it. We're not developing this part the way we want it. I'll give you an example. And I'll use tennis as the example this time. A young player who's got beautiful technique, just looks incredible. All right. But then, you know, when the ball's fed or hit nicely to them. But as soon as they get into an open play situation, maybe competition, They've got a very poor ability to actually adjust the swing, maybe shorten it up, maybe lengthen it if they need to create pace, maybe you know, swing that little bit uh, sl slower to absorb pace, maybe swing that little bit lower for a low ball and adjust the swing to hit more topspin, whatever it may be. They've got no ability to, or very poor ability, to read what's happening and then adjust the motor skill for what's actually happening in an open situation. So that would be an example of just training this part of the brain compared to not getting this linking happening. So ideally, yeah, we want all those great swings and that beautiful technique, but we want it to be adjustable. We want it to work with this part of the brain so that 
you know, we get adaptable skills, skills that can, uh, can be applied in open situations successfully over and over again. <laughs> so ensuring that kids are developing these motor skills with the perceptual event that is happening before it as closely replicated to what's going to happen in the competition as possible. And that's going to mean that the development between the parts of the brain that understand visual information and the parts of the brain that deliver those adaptable motor skills become more well connected, more integrated, and then we get you know, the great players, the, the great athletes, and, and the, the extremely efficient and adaptable skills. Okay, so we know what perception action coupling is. We know how it relates to the brain and how it helps brain development. Now, how do we coach with perception action coupling in mind? Or how do we ensure that that's what's taking place? How do we improve the skill learning experiences of kids and so that this is, this is happening? So there's two ways. The first one, and the first thing to, to ask yourself is, what's my athlete seeing? And can I improve this or improve what they're seeing so it more closely replicates what they're going to see in a competition environment? Is, how can I improve it so perception and action are coupled more accurately? So that's the first thing. And I gave some examples over there before. All right, how can I you know, get other players moving in different positions. How can I move in different positions and become part of the activity more so that it more closely reflects it? And there's lots of different options that, you know, with, you know, the way players are set up and the way the coach comes in and is included in the environment. The second one, and this is, this is really important, is how can I help them to attend or pay attention more specifically to aspects in their visual field? Now, before we go any further, we have to deal with one thing here. Now, when someone is playing a, a, a sport where they see and they do something very, very quickly, a lot of their reacting and their reading the play happens instinctively. They're not able to necessarily really concentrate on one thing. And a lot of it comes back to all the experiences and all the memories they've created through training and practice before. However, what we can do when kids are young is help them attend to certain things in their visual field or in their environment that would over time help them more, um, more, more quickly learn and develop those um, perceptual skills. So you can give them instructions all right, in terms of what to, what to look for. Um, so say for example, cricket this time. All right, so with cricket, if someone's bowling spin at a batter and there's a young batter, the coach could very, could very easily say, hey, well, we want you to watch the hand position and if the hand comes down that side of the ball, it's going to be off spin. If it goes around that way of the ball, it's going to be a leg spin. You know, so watch, and, and the coach could you know, give instructions in terms of how to watch the hand to actually try and get the kid to actually read what's happening more. And that would be what we, you know, what we obviously do and coaches do all the time. And... You know, that's great and that's what we should do. And the, but the other way to do it is to try and design drills, so you don't have to say as much, but design drills that require them to attend to certain things. All right, and that can be difficult, but it can be done really, really nicely. And so within a competitive situation of a drill, kids are actually attending to these things that you want. And it's really helping this happen, and it's really helping their perceptual and anticipation skills develop. I'll give you a really good example. It's a, a tennis example where kids are have doing an activity and in tennis, say for example, we, when someone's stretched wide in the court, they'll have to go what we call open face. So they might have to, they'll be stretching and they'll have to you know, chip the ball back with an open face so the ball floats up off the strings, either side. So they may be rallying and we can set up a drill that requires a kid that if they can sneak volley, so if they stretch their opponent wide, and they make it so that the other person's got a chip, and if they were to rush in and take a volley out of the net, because they, you know, because the other person had to chip it up when they were stretching, they may get some bonus points. All right? Or it might be another drill where we get, to get kids to play some slice shots, or rally, sorry, for example, and then in, in the rally, they've got to hit some slice, and if someone slices it, they've got to be able to volley it on the full, or call it before it goes over the net. 
So different, different drills that actually help them attend to those things. And that can be done in any, in any sport, all right? And obviously the coaches in the individual sports are the best people to actually know what kids will uh, instinctively or, or learn to look for over time and make those things a little more evident in the actual visual field. <laughs> so the two things that coaches can really do, uh, practical outcomes to make perception action coupling happen in the, in the actual skill learning experience is, is one, <laughs> All right, improve, always look to have that visual field, what they're seeing is closely replicated to the performance environment. And then two, trying to get the young athletes to attend more specifically to things in their visual field. And that will heighten that perception action coupling through either instructions or great drill design. All right. So the last thing I want to go through with you is number four. All right, number four on our list about perception action coupling. And I want you to just think for a moment, just think for a moment about this little calculation we're going to do here. Say for example, from 6 to 9 years, 9 to 12, 12 to 15 years, say for every uh, minute that a kid was playing their sport of choice, they had four skill learning experiences just in a minute. Now that's just picking, could be more, could be a little bit less. And that's 60 minutes to an hour. And that's four hours a week that they might be playing that sport. For 52 weeks of the year, for three years between six and nine. That comes up to 149,670 skill learning experiences. Well, next calculation, nine to 12 years, four skill learning experiences a minute, 60 minutes, eight hours, 52 weeks for three years, 299,520. From 12 to 15, four skills, 60 minutes, 12 hours a week, which is probably about what good young athletes would train in their sport, 52 weeks of the year, they might have some weeks off, but we'll keep it at 52, for three years. 499,280, and I hope my trusty iPhone calculator served me well in those calculations. That's a total of 898,470 skill learning experiences between the age of 6 and 15 years. Now, just for imagine, imagine that we could improve by trying to adhere to this a little more closely, just even 30%, just 30% of those skill learning experiences, maybe we could, uh, maybe we could have an impact on. 30%. And if we did that, if we could coach at 30% better or 30% more in tune with this, just those moments where we think, hey, I could actually improve that drill a little bit by doing this, this, and this. Or I want them to work on this. I could come, I've got a great drill. I've designed a new drill. Maybe someone else shared it with me. New drill that you know, helps, them, helps them have this perception action coupling a little bit better. That would equate to 269,541 improved skill learning experiences between the ages of 6 and 15, those key develop, really I suppose key developmental years, learning years, you know, learning how to introduce the sport, learning how to play, and then starting to think, hey, I like this school, take this sport, take it more seriously, to hey, really getting into training and trying to become, you know, possibly even a pro. So that, if we take the 269,541 improved skill learning experiences, we're going to end up with Better anticipation, better situational reading, better decisions, and better ability to adapt motor skills. All right, these ones will become more easy, or they'll be able to do, make better decisions and adapt their motor skills because these ones are happening more. And we've actually shown, and this has been shown in research as well, and like anecdotally, I'm sure we all, all agree that it's not necessarily the, the, the speed in skill-based sports of the athletes. It's not necessarily the best technique. It's very often, it's these things that make the actual difference between expert performers and those kind of sub-elite or non-expert performers. Probably, possibly, you know, the good, the good players but may not be really pros or not might be the great players. It's these things that makes the difference. There's research to, research to support that and this is going to make a massive difference to how these develops over all these years. So if you can do this better, Make the difference here, you end up with these. And think about the brain and what we learn about the brain and why that is the case 
for all this stuff. All right, now, uh, if you want to try and have a look at some more, some skills and some more videos, check out skillforkids.com. We've got heaps of drills, heaps of skill learning um, activities that kids can perform, and there's heaps of other reading and watching that you can do on this type of stuff. Possibly stuff you won't get anywhere else uh, on the net, so check it out, and there's heaps more uh, great stuff on coaching and skill acquisition on skillforkids.com. Skillforkids.com.